So welcome to ECE 503 Lecture 4. And so in today's lecture, uh, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be covering several topics in discrete time systems that are described by difference equations. In particular, we're going to be looking at the general concept of the dif difference equation and how it applies to DT systems. We'll also look at uh, linear time invariant systems and how they can be described by something called a constant coefficient difference equation. There's a specific class of which is called the linear constant coefficient difference equation, or LCCDE. And then finally, we'll go into figuring out how we can implement discrete time systems using uh, a variety of delay blocks and uh, recursion, recursion and, and multiplies and adds. Okay. So let's go into slide mode, full screen. OK, so, um, so up until now, we've noticed that, for instance, we saw what linear time invariance is all about, right? Uh, in terms of the linearity property that we apply to a system. So we, if we feed in an input or a combination of two inputs, what we should be getting is a combination of the two corresponding outputs uh, at the other end. And then the time invariance property, same thing. If we have a linear shift or we have a shift, time shift, with the inputs, we should see a corresponding time shift at the outputs. And the combination of the two gives us these LTI systems. So the LTI system... We're going to be seeing extensively in this course and use it to describe most of the systems that we'll be analyzing and, and be implementing through some of the problem sets, especially our course project later on this semester. And so what we want to look at now is, um, first of all, the concept of convolution, which we covered in the last class. And, and we feed an input x of n. And we convolve it with h of n, the impulse response of the system, to produce an output y. And so the first thing we want to ask ourselves is, OK, um, you know, we, we can do convolution um, with an impulse response and an input to provide the output. And if it's finite, if it's a finite impulse response, this is great. It's not that bad. The convolution between an FIR, finite impulse response, h of n, and an input x of n, no problem, we can do it. But things get tricky when we deal with infinite impulse responses, or IIR. How do you convolve that? When does it end? And the problem is the nature of IIR. It goes to infinity. So even if we have a finite impulse, uh, sorry, finite input, finite length input, and we have an IIR impulse response for a system, we have to convolve and convolve and convolve, and for completeness, until infinity. That's not practical. So this is where difference equation kicks in. So difference equation, as the name implies. So what sounds like difference equations? Differential equations, right? So we, so we need to look at the discrete time equivalent of a differential equation. And I know most people love differential equations. But trust me, this is a little bit more straightforward, or at least my perspective, than a differential equation. So the trick is following. So, so here, you know, there's an example and such, but, but really what we want to look at is we want to leverage this very important concept called recursion. So what happens is, suppose if we can characterize the output, if we can characterize the input-output relationship right, of a system in terms of some sort of recursive feedback loop, where we can now represent, let's say, an output in terms of past outputs and current inputs, or and past and current inputs, um, we can simplify the expression and yield something that's closed form that we can analyze, and we don't have to worry about convolving all the way until infinity. Right? So case in point, um, here's an example of, um, uh, of, uh, of a system. So what we got here is, OK, we got y, y of n. And it's equal to this um, 1 over n plus, um, uh, sorry, 1 over n plus 1 times the finite summation of x of n. So it's essentially a sum of uh, current and, and uh, uh, a collection of different inputs at different time instances to produce this output. Um, so, so what happens is this is great. So it's some sort of a cumulative average, right? within the time interval 0 to n. So what we want to do instead 
is can we simplify this better? So for, for instance, like so this n, that's great. We can go uh, all the way. Unfortunately, this n, suppose this goes all the way to infinity. Then we're in trouble, right? So suppose that this guy is taking continuously an average of all x values, right? And so it's snowballing. So it's like, OK, here's the first input. Oh, and then here's the first and second. And then here's the first, the second, and third. So what this does, this representation, notice that n goes from 0 to infinity. So we're running the risk that at, n, at, y, at y infinity, or y approaching infinity, this guy's going to be quite huge. And how are you going to analyze this? Right? Does anybody know how to analyze that? The goal here is we're going to exploit the, the structure of this. So we know that at y equals 0, we're going to have 1 over, sorry, so y0 is going to be 1 over 1, because n is 0, times uh, k equals 0 to 0. So it's essentially 0, x0. OK, great. And then y1 is going to be equal to y, uh, sorry, 1 over 2. And then that's going to be multiplied with um, x of 1 plus x, uh, x of 0, right? And then the next one, we have one more term thrown into it, multiplied by a new term in front of it. And then so on and so forth. So it's just snowballing. It's accumulating. So the way to kind of put, put the brakes on this and provide a more closed form solution without expanding to infinity is we do the following. We look at the previous output representation. Let's look at n, y n minus 1. And what we do is uh, y n minus 1 is equal to, in this case, if we plug in n minus 1 throughout the expression, what we're looking at is all the n minus 1 input samples Okay? And sum those together and multiply by 1 over n. Okay? So that's the average. Average of the n minus 1 inputs. And then what we do is we rewrite y of n in terms of y of n minus 1 and x of n in order to get that output. So what we get is something that looks like this. This is great. So l l let me actually, let's see if PowerPoint works with us today. OK. Hello, PowerPoint. So let's choose blank slide. OK. So what does this mean? So let's say we have, uh, where is it? Depends. Black. No, let's do that. So we have both sides. So what we've got is, OK, so, so we have y of n is equal to 1 over n plus 1. And we have the summation of all those guys. Uh, k equals um, 0 x of n. So, And then we know that uh, n goes 1, 2, all the way to infinity. That's going to be the problem, right? Because what happens when n is huge? We're going to have a trail of x of n's that are all going to be summed up together here. and um, at some point, this, this might not be manageable. So what I want to do instead is, can we really keep it to looking at the most instantaneous input? Can we have a re representation of uh, you know, some sort of catch-all of all the previous outputs, and then represent the output in terms of that? So what we do is the following. So first of all, what I want to do is, let's say we rewrite this as so, and this is totally legit. I can say, OK, oh, sorry, OK, bad. And then let's say we have the summation k, 0, n minus 1, x of k, right? And so we know at the same time that this guy here, right? So uh, what can we do with him? Well, we know that y of n minus 1 is equal to 1 over n, k equals 0, n minus 1, x of k. Right? And so if we now play that trick, OK? So uh, in that case, first of all, let's move this guy 
over to that side. So we can rewrite him in terms of uh, y n minus 1 times n is equal to that summation. And then we can plug, we can replace him with, with all of that. So at the end of the day, what we get is plus n, n, minus, um, n plus 1, sorry. And then um, y, n minus 1. So why is this important? Because if we, let's say, characterize a system, like, you know, we can either have a long string of delay elements, right? So let's say we take this input. Oh, now we, we, need, we need a memory element to hold him for the next output. Oh, we need another mem memory element to hold him for the next output, and so on and so forth. We're going to have a lot of memory elements, right? Very, very inefficient. On the other hand, what we could do, 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 do. Uh, alt, I. Alt A. No. Control A. Yeah, that's it. So what we can do instead is instead of having, let's say, multiple inputs, what we can do is we can have our our input. We we have that block. So, I. Is there a eraser? Yeah, there is. So what we can do instead is we have, let's say, x of n. We feed it in, there's, it's multiplied. It's multiplied by 1 over n plus 1. And that should give us y of n, except for the fact that now we also take this guy's output. And we, as we're going to see later in this particular lecture, we have a delay element. Let's say delay by 1. Right? So now what we do is we get y of n minus 1, and then multiply him by n, whatever the value of n is, and add them. Right? So instead of having sort of this like chain of delays, so the alternative to implementing this would have been awful. So what you would essentially have, um, and this would snowball into an inefficient implementation, is let's say you have your input, x of n, right? And you feed it, and you get y of n. And then you would need to take one of those x of n's and delay it, delay. And then at some point, um, you'd need to add it. Then you would need to take this guy, delay him, and then add him, and so on and so forth. So in the end, you have, you're going to, essentially get an infinite number of delay elements adding, 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 adding progressively all the, uh, the, the uh, inputs and delayed versions of them in order to produce one output. Is that conceivable in an actual system? Absolutely not. So the uh, system above, this guy here, is actually used in, t in order to, like how many delay elements in this guy? Just the one. There's a recursive loop, and that has some uh, ramifications later on, because what happens with the uh, feedback loop is if there's any instability, um, you're in trouble, right? Like, uh, if you have a feedback loop and it's a positive feedback and, and, and it's not bounded, um, your, your system will, will, of course, not, not be so good. All right. So that's what uh, this lecture slide's about. Oh, and that's snow falling from the roof. So um, that's exactly what I drew on this slide over here, where what we essentially have is you have your system, you have the multiplic multiplicative factor, and you have also um, the multiplicative factor here in order to produce your output. The feedback is going to be your friend, and, and in terms of saving a lot of hardware or implementation costs and such, the z minus one. We're going to see z minus one over and over again later on in this, this the, the, in two in next lecture when we talk about z transforms. But z to the minus one signifies um, a delay element, a delay by one. If you see z to the minus n, 
it means we're delaying it by n time samples. So just as a notation. If you see it's z to the 1, not minus 1, or z to the n, this actually re represents, and in a non-causal world, this would work, um, uh, that would re represent a, t a time advance. So you're actually looking forward by el n elements and stuff. And that only really happens if you have like recorded uh, material. So let's say you have a sound file, which you guys will have for your problem set too. Uh, what happens is um, y if you have some sort of advance element, like a z to the n, you're looking ahead in the recorded, in, uh, recorded data in order to do whatever signal processing you're trying to do. So that is um, sort of, the, this, is, this sort of puts into context this idea of the difference equation. So, it, so just like in differential equations where you had, let's say, y to the t is equal to the derivative of y, first order derivative of y um, multiplied by some coefficient, uh, plus second order derivative of y, and so on and so forth, plus an input. We're doing the discrete time equivalent here using difference equations, all right? And so where do we use these difference equations? So, so this is a kind of a cute example, but it, it has so much more, um, so much more uh, power behind it. And so one place we use it is in the analysis of LTI systems. And so we have something here called the constant coefficient difference equations. And you might say, what? What's constant coefficient about it? And the constant coefficient comes from this little guy here, the a. So in this case, so in the last example, we had coefficients all right, but they, they weren't constant. So 1 over n plus 1 or n, these are not constant. These, these change over time. What we're looking at here with constant coefficient equations is that any time we take, let's say, some element, either the input signal or the output signal fed back into itself, what we end up doing is we multiply by A. And A does not change with time. Or B, or C, or A1, whatnot, right? And so the constant coefficients difference equation really is we have these A's, these B's, these constant coefficients in line with multiplying against the input and output data. And so that, that's really the punchline. That's what makes this thing different relative to, say, what we saw before, where we had n and one, more, uh, one divided by n plus 1 and such. Now, um, when we deal with these uh, constant coefficient difference equations, so I know, I'm, I'm always referring back to differential equations. How many people here took Diffie-Q's, differential equations? How many people liked differential equations? Okay, okay, okay. I wasn't a fan because, uh, I have to admit, like, you know, that's great that you guys were, liked it. I, I wasn't a fan because I was in a enriched differential equations course when I was an undergrad. So my first year, I took like a sophomore level. So I was a freshman, I took a sophomore level differential equations course with honor math students. That was not fun. So that's, that's why I'm sort of jaded with differential equations. Okay, but that's good you guys like it. So. Um, remember in differential equations, we always talked about when we had a differential equation, we talked about the initial condition, right? And so here we have the exact same issue. Well, you know, how do we set up the initial, uh, initial condition for a difference equation? And there's more. There's um, and just like the difference, a, different, a differential equation. So what ends up happening is we're always, we're, we're concerned about several things. So the first thing is, we want to look at um, a specific scenario. So suppose we look at a situation where the input signal is 0 for, all pa uh, for, 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 for n less than uh, or equal to 0. So basically, whenever n is 0 or less than 0, our input is 0. Now, we notice that we had some recursion, right? We had past values of the output. We need to initialize that. So what do we do? So let's say we set y minus 1. So, that's the, the, so that, that sample there, that, in, that output value, that past output value, has no definition, right? Like, if we assume that everything x, right, 0, n equals 0 and before is, is, is 0, what we need to do is, okay, uh, now we need to figure out that y of n, uh, n of, uh, sorry, y minus 1 what do we do? This guy here, how do we define it? Because what we notice is that from that, it produces y0. 
y0 plugs into the next guy for y1. And if you then expand out y0, then hey, we have y minus 1 again. And if you continuously do that, we always go back to y minus 1. So we need to define it somehow. So what do we do? What we do is we actually have to define two parts of this difference equation, given that we have a y minus 1. The first one is something called the zero state response. So what we want to do is, how do we set this up? How do we set up this difference equation in terms of what do we define y minus 1 to be? The first one is, let's say we let y minus 1 equal to 0. So in that case, what we do is, that's when we call it the zero state response. Basically, we have an initial condition where the previous output value at y minus 1 is equal to 0. Who cares what the input is? The input is 0 for all past values of that. But let's say we just say, OK, even the output starts at 0, starting at, um, at y minus 0 all the way to minus infinity. And then at that point onwards, when we feed non-zero inputs, we get non-zero, potentially non-zero outputs of our system. So everything is initialized to zero. So given that, what does our expression break down into? Our different difference equation now is equal to, essentially, given that expression, that, that summation that we saw before, but this is a special expression. We call this, again, the zero state response, so we denote it as yzs of n. So this is the first part of the total response that we're going to develop here for the difference equation. All right? And that this guy actually, ironically, if you look at it, is actually a convolution um, for this particular situation. So let's say we have this format for this constant coefficient uh, expression, right? So in general, like if we go back to this diagram, potentially we could also have uh, a coefficient here for the input. But we normally keep that to, to 1, to unity, right? We don't care to multiply a constant coefficient to that. So we keep the inputs as they are. We don't multiply by any co coefficient. But for the feedback loop, we often have some sort of multiplicative constant there. So in the general expression for that simple recursive loop, we have this, and then we notice how the a's just keep on getting bigger and bigger and bigger in our expression. And so we have essentially this geometric sequence, and we have these delayed versions of x, the input. And what we notice is that it looks like a convolution, right? We have a k. Let's say that's a function. Let's say we call it um, f of k. And then let's say we have x n minus k. That's the other function. It looks like we're convolving the geometric sequence with the input x, right? Really important stuff. Now, the other thing is when we do not assume that we have in an, um, the, the, the um, let's say the uh, y minus 1, we do not assume that it's 0. We don't have a 0 state at the output. So rather, let's say we don't perturb. We do not perturb at all the system at all. We, don't, we feed in zeros. Our inputs are just feeding in zeros. How will our system behave given that we have a y minus 1 that is not 0? What do we have? And the answer is this gives us something called the zero input response or natural response. So this case, what the, the natural response or zero input response does, it says, suppose you have a y minus 1. It could be any y minus 1, but I don't feed in an input to excite the system, right? How does it look like? What's the output? And so this has a snowballing effect as well, but it's with respect to y minus 1. So my y minus 1 is our sort of our initial value. And then it builds up, builds up, builds up from there. So if you go back again to the feedback loop, suppose this is just 0. So essentially, what is some non-zero value and a 0 added together? It's going to be that non-zero value, right? So that adder disappears. We don't have an x of n. Essentially, it's just cycling constantly. And, we, and suppose that we start off with y minus 1 here. It goes through this delay element multiplied by a. 
and just continuously cycles through. So at the end of the day, you get something that looks like this. And we call that, again, the zero input response to get the total response of the system, the magic, the final end result is you combine zero input with zero state response to provide you with the overall response of the system. So this will totally characterize what your system looks like in terms of um, the I.O. relationship um, uh, uh, given these two, um, uh, both the zero state and zero input. This is exactly like differential equations. Rem does anyone remember this? It's the same thing. So if you have, let's say you have your zero state, so you assume that um, like, you know, your, your, your uh, initial output is equal to zero, and then at the same time, you have your uh, zero input state where essentially you don't feed anything into your differential equation, into your system. Well, what does your system look like? What is the output that's provided? You combine the two together, and that's your differential equation. This is the discrete time equivalent. So when you do that, you get this total overall response. And then, um, let, let's say, if we just think generally for a minute, okay? So let's say um, you have more, like, let's say we have a combination of both um, inputs and delayed version of inputs, and you have a combination of um, recursive fed back outputs and delayed versions of, of output values all fed into, back into the system. What do you get? What you get at the end is this LCCDE. This linear constant coefficient difference equation. And so you might say, what, what is this? What this guy is, essentially, is you take a bunch of output values and their delayed versions, and they're multiplied by some sort of constant coefficient. You have a bunch of input values and their delayed versions, and some of them, all of them, are multiplied by a, a constant coefficient as well. Notice. Actually, it's kind of interesting that here we make the assumption that the first, basically when we have the non-delayed version of the output, y of n, we assume a naught has no coefficient multiplied against it other than unity. Right? So how does this guy look like? So let's see. And I don't know what this guy is. OK, OK. Doo, 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 doo. So let's say we take this guy. So let's say we take that expression that we just saw. So we have a summation. And, um, and suppose you have k equals a 0 uh, to n. And we have y of what? Um, n minus k. And then we have a k. And then we have, um, let's say we call it l, 0 to m. And we have b k x n minus l. So what we've got here, OK, and we, make, we also note that a 0 is equal to 1. So what, how does this look like? And we're going to look at this later on. This is actually going to be a recurring theme in this course. It's going to appear at least in several other instances in this course. And so what will this look like? Well, for instance, we know that feeding into the system, we're going to have, um, so here's our coefficient. That's going to be our b0, right? Actually, let, let, me, let me take that back. What we're going to get is the following. So, So we're going to get, uh, obviously, we're going to have x of n. And what's also going to happen is we're going to delay by 1. And then this guy, now this branch here, so x of n, we're going to have x n minus 1. That's a delayed version. We're going to have x n minus 2. And then we're going to have a delayed version, da, da 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 all the way to the nth delayed version, right? And then, of course, we're going to have um, here, we're going to have b0. We're going to have b1. We're going to have b2, and so on and so forth. And then everything's going to feed back, right? We're going to sum these guys together.
So at the end of the day, what we've got is we have this guy represented here. At the same time, what's going to happen is um, we're going to have this, this side here. Right? And so how will this look like? Okay. And so this guy here will also have a representation. So th there is going to be some sort of feedback representation where let's say we have, so we have our um, y of n, right? And a, a0 is 0. And what we're going to do, what we're, what, what we're going to see happen is this guy can actually be decomposed. So the trick is this guy here. We're going to take out the y, y of n term, right? And what we're, so that means the k equals 0 term is going to be extracted. And everything left is going to be put on the other side. So what we're, we're going to end up getting is, so we have now our y n term. It gets just like here, sorry. I should be cleaner of my notation. So let's say we have z to the minus 1. So now that produces y n minus 1, correct? And then we feed that. Um, we multiply it by a1. That's our constant coefficient. We then feed it into another delayed term. We get y n minus 2. And then feed that in, we get a2, and so on, right? And then that guy, just as before, okay, we feed that in, and that goes back into y of n, and that guy, too. Well, we'll see, um, there should be a negative term. So somewhere, so, uh, so that term, if we bring it to the other side, it actually negates. So at some point, we need to negate the whole shebang. So it should be at this point, minus 1. So what you end up getting at the end is a series of, of delayed input elements multiplied in this structure and added together at this instant here. right? So delayed input values multiplied by constant coefficients and then all added together to produce the combination of those input values. At the output, so we extract, this is our desired output at the present. You have delayed versions. So these are the memory of your past input values. You have the coefficients of those guys that you multiply with them. And then you sum them together. And then the sum of these two, and, and the ne negative one is because we bring the summation to the right-hand side, combined with the input values, gives you your output value. So the power of this structure, so this is a generalized structure, and you'll see a lot of this. This is actually called the direct form 1 representation of the discrete time system. Direct form 2, we're going to see this a little bit later in this lecture, is when what happens is you have, um, you, you rotate the, the two sides together to cut down on number total number of multiply, adds, and uh, delay elements, which is a hardware savings. Okay, but we'll see that a little bit. I'm, going a little bit ahead of the material, but just to give you sort of perspective why we represent this as we do, it's because of, um, you know, this generalized structure we can do, it's a very powerful tool. We can represent a lot of LCCDE systems using this, as we'll see later on, right? All right. So, so now we have that, 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 um, this difference equation. So now let's try and find a, a solution for it. So in order to find a solution for this uh, LCCDE, um, so what we have is we have the total solution. And so there's, there are, just like before, when we have an overall response and we have the uh, zero state and zero input response, for the LCCDE, we also have, uh, when we try and compute a total solution, we have something called a homogeneous solution, and we have a particular solution. All right. So the homogeneous solution um, is when we have essentially um, all all the uh, output values in their delayed version is equal to zero. And what is the structure? Same thing, just like differential equations. 
except again we're in discrete time. And so what we do is, just like in Diffie Q's, what we do is let's assume that um, the homogeneous solution has a format of lambda n, and lambda some sort of constant. So what we do is we try and solve for this expression, including the AKs and such, using this form lambda n. And so when we plug in lambda h n into this expression, what we essentially get at the end of the day is this train, if you will, of all these, uh, 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 you know, all these possible roots. So, so essentially what this degenerates into um, is the homogeneous solution. If we pr plug in this possible, assume this solution, and plug it into this expression here, what we end up getting is we can solve for all the possible roots of this solution. So if we plug it in, we have all these lambdas. So what can, how, what are the possible solutions for this y h of n? And so what we end up needing to do is to solve for lambda 1, lambda 2, all the way to lambda n. And the particular solution, on the other hand, is when we have a very specific input fed into it. So the first part, what we try and do is we try and find the roots of just all these outputs in their delayed versions. The particular solution is when we have a specific input value. And so there are, again, just like in differential equations, in this case, this is very, very dependent on what your inputs are like. So um, in the table here, I kind of show kind of like if you have a specific input, your particular solution output should have this format. All right? So if you have a constant input, you're going to have a constant output. If you have um, an input that has some sort of exp uh, the, exp uh, the exponent is some sort of t uh, the time index, you're going to get a similar output particular solution, right? And if you have, in, uh, uh, let's say, a time index brought to some power multiplied by a constant coefficient, your output, your particular solution is going to be equal to essentially this uh, sequence of um, of, of uh, uh, exponential, so n to the m, n to the minus 1, uh, sorry, n to the m minus 1, all the way to km. And there are a variety of other combinations, including if it's a cosine or a sine, what you end up getting is a summation of sines and cosines with different constants. And then again, just like before with the zero state and the zero input uh, solutions, your total solution will be the combination of the homogeneous and the particular just like differential equations. So if you want to learn, if you want to get a little bit more depth, and, and again, like uh, in this course, you, you won't be exposed too much to um, uh, per se trying to find uh, the particular and the homogeneous solutions for a lot of the work. This is sort of to provide insights of where all of this is coming from and relating it to differential equations. But um, there's some really good um, examples um, in section 2.4.4. So um, that's some extra reading for you uh, tonight. So now we, we get to the part about the implementation of the discrete time systems, and that, that was actually what we j just did on the slides before. So in this case, um, what, I, what I showed actually in the previous slide, so let's zoom out. What I showed before with uh, the delay elements and the like. So this guy here is one implementation. So does everyone kind of understand where I got this from, more or less? Right? So this here. Um, is essentially like you know translating delayed elements of the input and delayed elements of the output and translating it into a series of delay elements and sums and multiplications with the constant coefficients. But this representation that we see here is not efficient. We have all these z's, all these delay elements, we have all these delay elements, we have all these adders, but it's kind of redundant, correct? What we're going to do Right? Direct form 2 allows us to translate input and output. Because at the end of the day, what you've got to be mindful of is that everything feeds into here, right? It doesn't matter now um, if you feed, like, you know, everything in this node is, this node here is going to be an output given this input. So what we want to do instead is can we take this guy here? and move them to this side, and this guy here, and move them to the other side, because I'm going to pull off a little trick. So we can totally do that in this case. What we can do is because the input and the output 
it really doesn't impact if we take this side and move it to the other side. We can actually have a little bit of hardware savings at the same time. Right. So here's, here's the trick. So let's say I do that instead. So same y and same x. Mm, no, sorry. OK. So now what happens is, suppose I move all that x stuff to here. And then what happens is we have all those delayed elements of x. We multiply it by b1, multiply it by b2, and so on, right? And then we have um, the summation process. So these all feed into the summations, and then feed, 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 summation, correct? And then remember the output? relationship well that's still legit so the only thing I left out so far is I have not in I have not positioned B0 in all of this okay so what ends up happening is we have Z to the minus 1 and that's taking this Y which is still there Y is still there And what we do is we add, we add, we add, boom, boom, boom. Okay? And so, again, the coefficients here we have are a1, a2, a3. Remember that a0 is equal to 1 in this case. So, and then at the same time, okay, now we need to figure out where do we put uh, b0 in, in, in this expression. And it would be over here. Okay? So B naught would go there. So let's delete this guy. So the, what, what the trick that people do with, um, we call it direct form 2, is that we merge. We merge the, the um, individual delay elements into one. So what we can do is we can actually bring these two guys together because they have the same signal path. They're all smooshed together, essentially. So why not they just get fed into a single delay element and then fed off to their respective directions and respective branches, right? And so we don't need two sets of delay elements. We just need the one. So that's the power of direct form, too. It's a little bit more efficient in terms of using less modules relative to um, um, the DF1. OK. Where does the negative one? Yes. Thank you for catching that. Um, so the negative 1 so, um, w would have been the summation of all. So let's find it. So let's say, so that's, that's the x part. That's the y part. So the negative 1 would have been here. That's a great catch. Because what happens is that summation, everything that gets accumulated because it was moved to the right-hand side needed, by, needed to be multiplied by negative 1. That's, that's there. Perfect. Thank you, chat. So given that, we have these two possible forms. And we're going to be seeing this again later on in this course. Okay. And so uh, just like what I mentioned, Direct form 2, we can actually do this merger into a single set of delay elements rather than two pairs in order to uh, streamline the process. And um, uh, exercise for a student, please read you know, section 2.5.2. And um, you know, in particular, look at the moving average FIR system. Okay? Because that would be, that, that's a kind of a nice example of a collection of these delay elements in action performing that specific function of essentially what a moving average is, is you have a stream, of, like you have an input stream, and you have a collection of delay elements that hold on to all of them, and then they're multiplied by constant coefficients and create a single 
uh, output value, and that output value is the average of the last n input values, right? And it might be a weighted output. So what happens is, let's say um, the older input values are weighed less than, let's say, the more recent input values for whatever reason. Maybe there's an importance weight. Like something more timely is weighted more. Something ancient I might not weigh at all, right? OK. The last topic, um, and this is kind of more for fun, and it's a little bit of a definition. I have a weird definition of fun, is uh, something called the correlation of a discrete time system. Or, sorry, discrete time signal. So um, if any of you play with radar, if any of you play with wireless data transmissions or geology or anything like that, so if you take my um, software-defined radio course, you're probably playing with correlation, or you will soon. Um, what happens is correlation is used in a lot of applications. And so how do you do that with a discrete time signal? Assuming that you don't do any subsampling or you, you select only a, a select amount of data, so let's say if you have all the information available, how do you perform correlation? The way correlation is performed is essentially you have, it's almost like convolution except that there's no flipping. You take the two signals, okay? So cross-correlation is one where you take two different signals and you say, here's two signals, multiply them together, sample by sample by sample, and what's the value? Okay. Shift one signal by one, repeat. Then shift that same signal by another one and multiply and, and repeat and calculate. And, and what happens is what, by doing that, what you essentially get is wherever you have a peak in that multiplication plus sum of all those uh, multiplied samples, that says that you hit some sort of high correlation value between those two signals. You can also do something called autocorrelation, where you take the same signal and you just shift, um, multiply sample by sample and sum, and see what the value is, and then repeat, repeat, repeat. And so where is this useful? Uh, what happens if the signals are periodic? What should you see? Is that e like whatever your fundamental period is, so every, let's say, big N samples, every time you shift, and every big N samples, you get a peak, and then you get a peak, and then you get a peak, and then you get a peak. It signifies that you have some sort of periodicity with your waveform. And that's what the autocorrelation would do. With the cross-correlation, it's useful if, let's say, you have the original signal and it's buried in noise, in which, like some unwanted signal. And you're trying to find, hey, where is it? Uh, you know, where is it approximately? I can't really see where it's supposed to be located. And especially if your signal is very long and your noise is a zero mean and additive white Gaussian, what ends up happening, or just additive, and zero mean, what ends up happening is, if you do that process, what happens if you have a thousand samples and you do this over and over again? First of all, a thousand points of the noise samples will sum to zero because it's zero mean. And all that's left is going to be the desired signal. All right? Okay. So with that, that, that concludes lecture four of uh, uh, 503. OK. So what we're going to do, uh, since I see everyone's sleeping almost, because uh, part, of, part of that is because of the